Well, welcome back. Welcome back. We have uh, two leaders now from MePush. And this is Connor Quinlan, who is the CEO and founder of MePush, and Pete Sieber, who founded a couple of cybersecurity companies and has now joined, uh, he's joined our advisory board. But Connor Quinlan and Pete Sieber are gonna talk about MePush and outline their journey to develop the technical skills, the culture and the discipline to lead two of the largest ransomware incident response services happening in America today. Let me uh, ask you to join me in welcoming Connor, and Quin Connor Quinlan and Pete Sieber. Let me get them teed up here. Hi, we're glad to be here today. Today, we're gonna to talk about the evolution and anatomy of a ransomware event, as well as the evolution and anatomy of some other stuff, which I think, and we hope that the audience is gonna find very interesting as we walk through this presentation. My name's Pete Sieber. I'm an advisory board member here at the Carolina Cyber Center. I've been involved quietly for a number of years as, as we've gotten this thing up and rolling to where it is now. Um, also, I was the founder of a company that worked in the cybersecurity as a service space that won the North Carolina Technology Association Cybersecurity Company of the Year back in 2019. I'm here with Connor Quinlan. Connor, could you tell everybody a little bit about yourself and, and what you do? Yep, I'm Connor Quinlan. I'm the founder of an MSP, an MSSP called MePush that I founded back in 2004. Um, recently, my company has been intensely involved in the frontline cyber hacking cleanup, the sort of recovery and rebuild of companies that are hacked from small to the Fortune 500. Um, and I've also recently founded a new company based on our frontline's intel. It's all about the ransomware resilience that is needed um, to make sure that people are not paying ransom payments. Excellent. Excellent. We're thrilled to have you here. So it sounds like you've taken uh, you know, a company from a traditional MSP space and now you're on the front lines and cutting edge of everything that's happening in ransomware. Uh, yeah, it's definitely a new day every day. <laughs> well, good. We'll get into that as we walk through it. So what we want to do here uh, with the audience over the next bit of time, just kind of the goals uh, of this session, we want to walk through, like we talked about, the evolution and anatomy of a ransomware event. We're going to get a little bit technical, but we'll stay on top and not get too technical as well to lose some folks. Um, but we're going to move from the recent past to the current environment. Um, and when I give these kinds of talks, you know, I, I guess I was a speaker here maybe two years ago at this event, and anything I might have said two years ago, ago about ransomware is completely irrelevant based on the world that we're living in now. And so we'll go through some details and explain what has happened and what's evolved so quickly you know, as we walk through some attack trends and techniques. Once we get through that, we're going to talk about business recovery efforts, right, which are the first things that you need to focus on. Um, when you have an event, how do you get back up and running? We'll go through some missteps some misconceptions and some lessons learned along the way. After that, we'll talk about the number one thing in this space right now, which is ransomware resilience, which is changing the entire look of the space from the insurance carriers and the trickle down effect to organizations and victims in the space. And we're gonna talk about the attributes of character here at the Carolina Cyber Center and how those attributes of character have played out within workforce development um, and have been a part of the me push story that Connor's going to walk us through. Um, and, and really, one of the things that I want everybody to walk away from right now is that as we walk through this evolution, this, in my opinion, it's really a punch counter punch situation right now where these business models by the threat actors are evolving so quickly. Um, and they're so sophisticated that not only the victims, but the insurance carriers themselves are kind of back on their heels reacting in real time as we move through these. So as we kick things off, I'll start with this quote. This is from the Forrester Report in 2019. Ransomware attacks are up 500% in 2019, right? This is a growth business. Um, and not only is it growing, but I think the more important word is that it, this is a business. These threat actors and these organizations do this with the intent of getting paid. And you know what was happening early in the life cycle is now much more sophisticated than what we've seen the last few years. So let's jump into some incident response and recovery uh, and some information from the front lines that, that we've come across and that Connor and his team are dealing with on a regular basis. So the evolution, you know, going back to, I would say 2015, 2016, and 2017, those were what we would call untargeted small game attacks, right? Small game because they were typically looking 
for lesser dollars in the ransoms and the trends and techniques were a little bit less sophisticated or much less sophisticated really than what they are right now. Things that we're all familiar with that maybe that we've heard in the headlines like Sam Sam and WannaCry, which we'll walk through. And then we move to the more targeted attacks. So think of this as a startup organization, maybe in 2015 and 2016, that had kind of a beta product, right? And when you put a beta product out in the market, you're taking feedback, you're tweaking it, and then you move into the more targeted attacks, which is more, you're moving out of the beta, the beta phase and into more of the production mode um, at a higher level of attack that's more sophisticated, more complex, and asking for significantly more money in the ransoms. In the untargeted attacks, I think we're all used to hearing numbers like, you know, $5,000 ransom or Mecklenburg County, I think was $25,000 ransom. Atlanta was $56,000 ransom. Um, and then even Baltimore was, was 76. Those all fall in that untargeted, smaller game bucket. In these targeted attacks, Connor, you and your team, I think you're typically seeing ransoms in the million, two million, five million and higher bucket. Is that fair to say? Yeah, but recently we're seeing 20, 40, 50 million. That's so, so this is, this is getting out of control. So here's a little bit, um, you know, ransomware development over a period of time. We have a, a line of demarcation here, this orange line going from top to bottom, kind of separating the 2016, 2017 period in the, in the small game, lower dollar up into, you know, the, the, the large game, higher dollar, more sophisticated attacks that we're experiencing right now. Um, and, and again, to me, this just goes right back to, you know, the beta or the MVP version versus the production version in these growth companies. Yeah, I think, Pete, one other thing, if I can interject, you know, we were seeing names here like Sam Sam, WannaCry, and people probably think of these as, you know, threat variants. I mean, they are, but these are really businesses, as you mentioned. These are companies. You know, these are companies that we're talking about that, you know, if you added IFY to or, or LY, they'd be a cool Silicon Valley startup name. But these companies are making a lot of money. Um, so I just want to kind of make sure I reiterate your point that, these are business organizations. Yes, they're probably state-sponsored or organized crime, of course, but they operate like companies. Yeah, I, I completely agree. You know, to your point, if the name of the company was Ryokify or We Ransom, you know, <laughs> these might be considered high-growth startups from the West Coast that everybody would be willing to dump their money into an IPO. I'm not trying to legitimize uh, anything that they're doing. These are criminal organizations, but I think everybody needs to understand these are business models and they're evolving um, just as quickly as legitimate business models. So, and we'll see that as we walk through these next few slides and get a little bit technical. So let's talk a little bit about Sam Sam. Um, this is a, um, a ransomware group that people are familiar with by name. Um, and what they did that was unique, and this falls into the small game, you know, bucket, you know, where ransoms were in that five, ten, fifteen thousand dollar level. They moved beyond traditional email phishing based attacks to get into to get into the victims' environments. They searched for open remote desktop protocol or RDP and exploited those vulnerabilities to brute force their way into environments. Right. And when they brute force their way in, it's really a two part attack. You have to brute force the username and credentials themselves, and then brute force the password. But once they successfully do that, they can move laterally using other tools to really spread across the environment. Um, and Sam Sam was out there for a long time, but it was the first true enterprise-wide ransomware that existed. Um, and then as we move into the next one, what, what Sam Sam is, falls into what I call more of the smash and grab because it was not automated. They had to move from one device to another one at a time. So they had to move very quickly um, to lock down machines and then get in and get out. In May of 2017, this is when the world really woke up in media coverage um, to you know, some of these ransomware events. I think we all remember WannaCry in the headlines. Um, and that was really, you know, the NSA had developed an exploit called Eternal Blue that was leaked by the shadow brokers, right? And it was essentially a Microsoft vulnerability. And after this happened, Microsoft obviously put out a patch for that vulnerability. But at that point, not everyone obviously applies a patch all at the same time. They had gotten into 200,000 systems in 150 countries, and it really just went global. And it really, it, it pushed itself into the consciousness 
um, really of the world. Um, so it was unlike Sam Sam and the, the threat actor um, in Sam Sam, the threat actor had to individually log on to each machine. WannaCry worked more as a crypto worm, right? So it got in and it could self propagate across systems. And then not only across systems, but across environments. And that's what created the spread to move so fast in an uncontrolled manner. Um, and, and really it locked down, like I said, 200,000 servers and systems in 150 countries across the globe. The big move here was that it was self-propagating due to the nature of its spread across server message block. So that was, you know, again, what we're seeing here is these ransomware gangs, as they're bringing money in from the ransoms, they're reinvesting in their business, evolving their business model, hiring smarter people, and doing things in a different matter to stay one step ahead of the good guys. July of 2018, we started to see something that was a bit different in these large game attacks, right? In these large game attacks, again, we're seeing larger ransoms and more sophisticated attacks where the victims get fully leveraged, and they get fully leveraged in a few ways. Number one, the first thing that's happening is that the, as the gotten more sophisticated, the threat actors are coming into the environment and destroying backup sets and recovery paths. And when that happens, the victim thinks they may be able to recover, but they find out later they're not able to recover. And if you can't recover at that point, you are facing, you have to either pay the ransom or you're starting from scratch. And this raised the stakes in the game significantly once they started destroying these recovery paths. And so what we started seeing with Ryuk and BitPamer is that they were working together with other cyber criminals in this cyberspace. So you're looking at not only the ransomware, but also the use of banking Trojans like Emotet and TrickBot coming into environments and, and essentially harvesting credentials in a worm-like fashion, taking those credentials out with, to a command and control server, and then selling those credentials on the dark web. So when that happens, then folks like Ryuk and Bitpamer can come back and many others can come back anytime they want to these organizations and hold them hostage several times over. And when the backup sets are deleted, it can work over and over again. So you started seeing the ransoms, the dollar value of the ransoms, um, really going up exponentially as these organizations became crippled. After that, in May of 2019, we started seeing two other organizations, GANCRAB and R Evil. Um, and GANCRAB, you know, was relatively well known because they actually announced their retirement in 2019. And in that announcement, they announced that they made essentially $2 billion in bottom line income in one year from their activities. And GANCRAB was well known because when you logged onto their Tor browser, um, you would see Mr. Krabs from SpongeBob, um, and it was just something that, that, that it was a much different experience. They actually started focusing on the customer experience of the victim, right? They were a relatively good group to work with. If you had issues with the different tools that they had out there, they would troubleshoot and help you use those tools. Their response times were pretty quick because they had, you know, um, they had automated uh, all of their services. So now you have the bad guys taking advantage of their victim in a very nice way. Why? Because they were fully leveraged. Again, going back to the deletion of the backup sets and the recovery paths. At this point, you can be nice about the way that you take advantage of the victim because you know that they have no escape um, from what they're trying to do. Um, and as soon as GANCRAB disappeared, suspiciously, another group called R Evil or Soda Kenobi, also you know, another name that they would use, they came onto the scene. And I say suspiciously because there were a lot of things that were very common between the two. They used the same Tor browser, the language in the ransoms was very similar, uh, the pattern used for file encryption was very similar, and they both used a ticking clock method in what they were doing. And in that ticking clock method, you know, they, if you did not hit your, you know, your ransom payment by a certain time, they doubled it. Right, so you're logging onto the Tor browser and then the clock starts. And if you don't make your payment, they know they have, it, they have you leveraged, so they double it. Um, and, and Connor, you've seen situations like this and been involved in these situations on the front lines. Absolutely, yep. We've seen, you know, previously negotiators would be able to get ransoms cut in half from the original ask. Now we're seeing ransoms being, you know, elevated or doubled. Uh, because the threat actors know 
ahead of time that there is no recovery path. So the choice is start from zero or pay. It's, it's crippling to these organizations and it's not just one server, right? When you talk about these self-propagating ransomware, it's going across all servers and doing significant damage. And so as we move more into GANCRAB, one of the things that they did that was unique was they offered two different decryption utilities. At this point, mostly when you're buying your decryption utility, you're paying on a per server basis. So what they brought was the universal decryption tool. So you could pay a negotiated amount, essentially bundled pricing, to decrypt all your servers using one tool, right? So you're getting better pricing um, and it's, it's a, it's, it can be quicker, right? And no guarantee on it from experience, but that option is out there. So you started seeing, again, more of the customer experience being built into um, these ransomware organizations um, because they knew that they were go going to get paid one way or the other, one way or the other. And then at the end of 2019, uh, we started to see doxing, right? And, and this was really, this was interesting because it was the intersection of two different things going on. You had one was ransomware, and then the second piece was now data exfiltration. So what they were doing in doxing is that they're making a copy of the data, taking it out of your environment, and extorting you that they're they're going threatening you that they're going to sell it on the dark web if you don't pay within a certain time. So this was new. And if you talk to a lot of the forensics analysts, there was absolutely no expectation that the ransomware organizations would ever take data out. They were just going to encrypt it and get paid. Um, this was a game changer as they started taking the data out. Um, and threatening to sell. And it's been released. I think we're familiar with this now. Um, there was a law firm in New York that had documents um, on a lot of entertainers and musicians and even the president of the United States. And that information was released because deadlines were missed. Um, and, and so th th I bring that up as a point because there's something called notification. And in a lot of states, when you have a data breach, when you have data that is exfiltrated out of the environment, that's a notifiable event, right? But the simple act of ransomware where they're encrypting the data but not taking it out, that's not necessarily notifiable. So with this, the evolution of doxing, the general public is gonna become much more aware of what's happening out there in the space and, and how just how crippling this can be to organizations. So Connor, we'll get into a little summary here of just the, the business model transformation and the evolution that we've seen take place, you know, through all of these that we just walked through, right? We started out with simple smash and grab for relatively low ransoms, and then we moved into this large game. But, but what's happened, right? We have, we moved from simultaneous deployment, uh, or, or I'm sorry, we moved from individual deployment device by device to simultaneous deployment and self-propagating strains, right? So the spread is, is very rapid across an environment. And then when that happens, we're seeing the bad guys actually do a lot of diligence in environments, right? They're, they're, they're searching for confidential documents. They're looking at your financial records to see what your biweekly payroll might be, because that's an indication of how much cash you may have on hand to pay in a short period of time and therefore they can appropriately set their, their ransom amounts. We talked about the leading backup sets and recovery paths. Uh, they, they developed the ransomware as a service. Once they were harvesting those credentials, they could sell those credentials and people could go in and deploy ransomware or have another organization do it for them. We saw the evolution of customer experience and pricing options, right? And then we had deadlines and doxing. So all of this has really changed very quickly over the last few years. And the one thing I'll underscore in all of this, you know, Connor, of, of all these evolutions, in, in your mind, what's the most significant that, that you see that was a game changer? Uh, number three in your list, that's the deletion of backup sets. Um, you know, there's doxing can happen in some organizations, you know, the data may not happen and may not care. And don't get me wrong, doxing is, provides leverage to the threat, threat actors, but the deleting of backup sets when you can't restore when you have to put all the pieces back together and start over and you don't remember how all is all set up because it's been built over years, 
that's what really um, skyrocketed the ransoms because you had to pay to get back up and running fast. Otherwise, you're talking weeks, months, and even just a normal recovery can be weeks, months, even when you're paying the decryption, you know, and paying the ransom to get the decryption utility. But when you have no path as an alternative, you can't argue. No, I, I agree. It's I don't know that I've seen anything evolve this quickly, you know, not only the threat actor side, but but give us some commentary on what you're seeing on the carrier side, the evolution of their business model as a punch counterpunch. Well, I think, you know, obviously there was a real jump in the amount of cyber insurance plans, right? People, businesses all over were getting cyber insurance, right? And for a long time, the carriers were collecting the premiums and no one was stating any claims. Now you have a skyrocketing amount of claims, tons of payouts, larger and larger ransoms that have to be paid. And so that really takes the profit and loss statement of the average carrier and turns it upside down. Um, so what you're now going to see in the future is more and more requirements for a business to be able to, instead of state on a piece of paper, yeah, we're compliant, we have these things, to actually confirming on a regular basis, potentially yearly, quarterly, I'm actually confirming that I have these protective measures in place. But you also see in the future confirming, you know, the ability to be resilient. How can you recover? Do you have backups that the threat actors cannot get to? And so, you know, you've got this here about everyday life. It's the equivalent of having your little driver app, you know, on your phone that proves that you're a good driver. Otherwise, you're not going to get insured because there's no way an insurance carrier is going to pay out continually, right, and lose money on the premium. So that has to happen because they're going to reinsurance providers, which are pushing down the insurance carriers, which are going to push down to the businesses. So in short, things are going to get more strict and more expensive for the business probably. Yeah, I, I agree completely. The, um, you know, at the end of the day, the organizations that are absorbing the cost of this are the carriers. As, as long as the victim has some level of cyber insurance, then the carriers are absorbing that cost. So the carriers become a big player in these cleanups in terms of what's done and how it's done. But now, since their P&L is really flipped, right, with, with the increase in the dollars of the ransoms and the amount of recovery effort that has to be made, the carriers are now not making the money that they'd like to make. So their model is evolving as well. But I think, Pete, one tidbit just to add to this is, you know, we've had to clean up insurance carriers. We've had an insurance carrier and their client breached and have ransomware at the same time. That's a real awakening to the reality of the pains of this and trying to be able to operate as a carrier while you're down yourself, right, is a motivating factor to never have to deal with this stuff again for your business and your clients' businesses. Absolutely. Well, let's talk a little bit. Um, we're kind of getting into the business recovery side of things. So I'll let you talk a little bit about, you know, what you see on the front lines with your team. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about business recovery. What is it, what's required and, and what are you typically walking into? Um, well, I would say the best you know, description is a, maybe a mini war zone, a battlefront. Um, we walk in and remember when we're coming in, you know, a internal I team is probably already trying to recover. They may have a few days into a weekend. So we walk into very stressful environments where people are already overwhelmed and exhausted. So we're that augmentation. We're the additional experts to really get the job done. And sometimes we're resisted. People don't want the help because they're trying to take care of it, but the carrier is involved and wants it resolved fast. Um, so we're in there. And really what we see consistently is just, you know, people get fired, people go to the hospital, there's infighting. It's not an ideal situation. People are under a lot of stress. And so what we really focus on is being the experts to sort of execute the tasks needed to get a business back up and running. But you've also got to consider when this is going on, the business still has its day-to-day -day operations to deal with. And so these IT teams are overwhelmed. They can't help the average users while fighting this whole fire. So not only are we doing recovery a lot, we're also providing additional help desk functionality. You know, if you've got 10,000 users and they all have to be reset, you know, passwords in one day or two days, the internal team can't handle that normally they can't handle it while fighting a fire so there's a lot of augmentation there just to assist um, getting the task done and helping the team deal with the average amount of tickets or or needs that a company might have for average productivity 
um, much less, uh, you know, being under underwater on fire, so to speak, during an event. Um, so really, you know, we're focused in there as the recovery team to do the tests. But, you know, there's also incident managers that we're working with that really to handle the project management and the execution of all the different pieces and players that are all involved in the average business recovery uh, incident. So it's, uh, I always remember the quote by Mike Tyson, right? Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Um, and that's when you guys walk in, right? Is when, when they've been punched in the face, they're bleeding from the nose, their hair's on fire. And whatever the plan was, it may have been documented. It may be 30 pages long. It may have been practiced. There's no practice like the real world event. And I think that's a good point. We are experts, right? We, as you can see in this slide, you know, we work with a team of incident managers that bring us in. We're the IT specialists, right? And that combination helps execute a business recovery. But, you know, the average internal team that has to deal with this, they've never dealt with this before. They're not doing this day in, day out. That's what these teams do, just like in other recovery industries, you know, whether it be fire or water or, you know, an oil spore or whatever. These are people who know how to do this on a day-to-day -day basis um, and therefore, a business can recover faster because they have the reps and the expertise. So talk to us, what does an optimal business response look like? Well, um, you know, as you can see here, there's an order of items on your slide, right? And though it looks very linear, I wanna clearly state that this doesn't happen in a uh, start with assess, go to contain, then go to recover and then reinforce. It's a very sort of cyclical uh, situation, but Obviously, we're trying to, when we get there, assess what is it that needs to be recovered? Is it 100 servers? Is it 1,000 servers? How many locations? How many users need help? What needs to be pushed out, et cetera? So we're really trying to get a lay of the land. Um, at the same time, we're working with teams um, to contain the environment because if you start recovering and rebuilding and the area that you're recovering into is not quarantined or safe, you're just going to risk reinfection um, you know, continual ransoms, you know, and all that sort of situation. So at that time, once we've contained, we really can start the recovery effort. But also keep in mind when we're recovering, we want to reinforce. So there may need to be server hardening, multi-factor identification might need to be laid down at the same time, password resets, any other resilience and reinforcement in, uh, where possible. But this is also happening in cycles. We may be assessing, containing, recovering, and then we've got to, you know, adjust some containment. We've got to then reinforce. So um, it appears linear, um, and, and it does progress that way, um, but a lot of these things are sort of layered on top of each other. But I want to highlight one key point, which is the reinforce piece. Um, and Pete, you and I have talked about this before. You know, a business really wants to recover and get back up and running, and that's important. And there needs to be reinforcement, but what we've seen in some situations is that businesses are in such a hurry to just recover and get back up and running that and maybe they got a next gen firewall or they got new, you know, antivirus or, you know, EDR solution on the endpoints. Um, but at the same time, like they're not making the deep investment in future reinforcements so the situation doesn't happen again. Um, so that's my only concern yeah. is risk of reinfection without making that sort of uh, reinforcement investment so we don't end up in the situation again. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we, we talked about this really looks like a war zone, right? So the players at the table, when all this is taking place, you have the entire executive team, right? You have the CEO paying attention, the president, you have maybe general counsel, the CFO, the risk manager, certainly the CIO and the chief security officer, right? All as part of that executive team. But you also have the carrier who is heavily involved because they're carrying the, the cost of of this for paying the ransom and, and the cost for the recovery. You're gonna have a breach coach. You're gonna have a breach recovery specialist team. You have external IT specialists. You have you know, a legal team. You have all of these people coming together for a 30, 45 day period of time. And while they're paying attention to this, to this hair on fire issue, they're not paying attention to every other operational issue. So once this gets, gets contained and they get back on their feet, it's human nature to go back to the other 15 projects that you were ignoring for the last 30 to 45 days. And that's where the, the, the last step, the reinforced piece, can sometimes get dropped on the floor and fall between the cracks. I've definitely seen that happen. 
So let's walk through, you know, from everything we've learned, right, and talk to the audience a little bit about missteps, misconceptions, and lessons learned along the way. Right, Connor just spent some time talking about, you know, external IT support being brought into light. Clients like to tackle these things themselves. Sometimes they don't like to acknowledge maybe what had happened or how it had happened. Um, and sometimes they'll, you know, they'll, the, the carrier will want to bring in the outside experts but the organization themselves is insisting that their IT team take the lead. Uh, at some point, they acquiesce, um, but poor decisions can be made along the way. And those poor decisions at the beginning can really handcuff and hamper the rest of the issues going forward. Um, you guys have seen strategies that can be too aggressive or too conservative from the get-go. You know, these strategies that are too aggressive open up the organization to possible reinfection or they, the environment was not properly cleaned or quarantined and, and the ransomware still exists, or it's too conservative, right? And, and when they're too conservative, the recovery can take too long. Uh, it can become too expensive and you can have too many cooks in the kitchen, right? So to speak in this environment. Um, we've seen missteps where clients believe that certain improvements to their environment can be made so that this doesn't happen again. Uh, the carriers can draw a bright line it is about recovering your environment, not improving your environment. Not that improvements aren't needed. As Connor spoke to reinforcements, they are needed. They are necessary. They're just not necessarily covered by the carrier under the policy. So people have to understand there's really two sides. It's what are you doing to recover? And then what are you doing to reinforce and improve? Um, and then this, you know, Connor, you spoke of the, um, you know, that it's not linear, right? Well, the goal line itself is not fixed either. Right. As you go through the recovery, you learn more about how devastated your environment is and that goal line and the time frame of achieving that goal line can move. So the process really does. Um, it becomes very, very fluid. And we've seen and you've seen these missteps happen in, in pretty much all the cases. I'm sure you can tell stories for days. Um, some misconceptions, right? Thinking that the environment will be identical to what it was before rarely the case. You may be able to recover, but that doesn't mean you're identical. Things are going to be broken. Things are not going to work that they the way that they used to work. Certain servers, certain things will be destroyed uh, and they take time. And and the, the silver lining is that in that rebuilding those processes, organizations can build them a little bit better. So I, I think it's a misnomer to say that it's going to be identical because when you rebuild or even recover, things can, can look a bit different. Um, unrealistic expectations about recovery time and effort. If you if an organization makes a, decide to, a decision to pay for the recovery keys, those recovery keys, Connor, tell me that that's not, a, you know, you plug it in and five seconds later, your data's back and you're going, right? This takes time. Um, whether it's you buy the universal key or one server at a time, this is a large human effort to get it done. And even thinking that it's cheaper to buy the decryption key, right? Um, it, it, it may be cheaper to recover. These are all business decisions that organizations have to go through. Um, and, and this is why we always stress, bring in the experts. The carriers will always want to bring in the experts because folks like me push have done this a hundred times over. And the chances are uh, there's not a whole lot of organizations that have been ransomed more than once, right? So they're doing things for the first time in a first time through session. So some lessons learned along the way. Um, the number one lesson I, I think we, we can acknowledge is that the risk is real, right? I, I would say in my 25 plus year career, I, I haven't seen an imminent business viability threat like exist in ransomware. We've seen situations where an organization can be humming along and within 45 days to two months, can be close to bankruptcy because they were either not insured or they were underinsured or it just too, took too long to get their business recovered. Um, and and this, is, um, this is a real issue where every person in your organization needs to come together at the executive team um, and also identify who the trusted advisors are. I think one of, the, one of the biggest concerns by the people that help recover and whether from the carriers to the specialists, no more speed dating. Right, you have to know who 
your, your, your expert trusted advisors are in advance. You have to develop those relationships so that you're not building that relationship while your hair is on fire. Um, this is a, a true risk. And um, I don't know, it's a shame, Connor, you've, you've seen businesses lost. You've seen CFOs and CEOs cry. Uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely painful to watch sometimes. I mean, I, we definitely try to approach these things with a lot of empathy. Yeah, we're in there to recover. People are not in great situations when this is going on. I mean, this is, I mean, in some wells, it's like, you know, an earthquake or a fire or a flood. This is, it's not pretty. Yeah, I, I think some people would say they'd rather experience two tornadoes and a flood uh, combined than go through these type of events. Um, lessons learned, let's talk about access. I mean, really, this is, you know, we've heard the term zero trust. It's been tossed around the industry for a while now. Um, this is something that organizations really need to adopt and adopt it from two primary levels, right? The principle of least privilege, which is talking about granting access the least amount of access required to accomplish the task at hand. Um, and this is done by function, not by individual or by name, but everybody in the organization who is at an analyst level requires a certain level of least privilege and nothing more than that. Um, and what this does is that as those credentials are potentially harvested, it helps limit the lateral movement by the threat actors across an organization. The other thing that, that we talk about in, and you hear a lot about in this space is MFA, multi-factor authentication. I think we all know what this is by now. It's really the digital equivalent of tying a double knot in your shoe. Um, and people need to understand the simplicity of it uh, and the need for it. I think that there will always be people out there who will say that it's too complicated. I don't want to take those two seconds. Um, but as we've all experienced as kids, when your shoe keeps coming untied, eventually you're going to take those two extra seconds to tie the double knot in your shoe. And it's the same thing about logging on to your critical application. There is, um, there's a firm out there called Coveware. Coveware are specialists in the negotiation and payment space with ransomware. Um, and they've done a, they did a study that said that if you deploy multi-factor authentication on all admin accounts, it helps reduce your risk by 40%, which is significant. Again, this is becoming very, very basic. The other lesson learned from organizations that, that are getting hit, a lot of them are just not performing your regular hygiene on a regular basis, right? This is your preventative maintenance. This is your vulnerability scans and your patching, developing that cadence, developing that culture of eliminating the low hanging fruit in your environment so that you are not in a position where you can get popped. So many of these attacks happen because of known vulnerabilities that organizations are simply not patching. There's an organization called Corvus Insurance that actually has started doing scans as part of their underwriting diligence process. And here's what they've learned. Ransomware claims, when they do this, when they do a scan upfront, when they underwrite and price the policy, they will perform a scan upfront, make sure that the client applies the patches. And when that happens, they've seen ransomware claims decrease by 65%. That's astoundingly significant, right? So this just speaks to low hanging fruit in the environment that the bad guys take advantage of. And then resilience, right? Um, ransomware from our very first slide, we know this from the Forrester report in 2019, it was $11.5 billion. This is an economics driven industry and the threat actors are going to get paid and we know the ransoms are skyrocketing because backup paths are, and backup sets are getting deleted and destroyed. So we all know and heard this, it's not a matter of if, but when, but it's also a matter of how much. So, you know, I, the, with the increase in the ransoms, I don't know in the business environment that people have increased their policy levels to compensate for the increased ransom. Meaning that there's a lot of folks who may be insured, but they're underinsured, but right? their policies are probably not up to the right levels. Um, which essentially means they're self-insured, right? The carriers will pop out at a certain number, um, and then it's up to the organization to foot the bill on the rest of the recovery. One thing that you hear all the time in the environment is you hear a potential victim before they get popped, they end up saying, I don't have anything in my environment that's valuable to an attacker. Nobody's going to want to take this information. And I call this a misnomer. The thought process is incorrect. 
because it's not that the information is valuable to the attacker. The attacker knows the information is valuable to you as a business owner. And you as the business owner can't run your business without that information. And that's why they encrypt it. And that's why you find out that you are the ones that can't live without the data. And that's what people need to start realizing um, and recognizing. And then importantly, and, and you know, all the preventative controls in the world, they're great. There's a ton of different point products and services out there, but it's also been proven that you can have all the right tech and all the right controls and you can still get popped and you can still be crippled. And this is why the entire industry on the carrier side is now focusing on, on resilience, right? Just the other day, I had a conversation with some carriers and in the old world, three and four years ago, they were pricing based on number of records or the amount of PII that an organization has. That is out the window now. They are now pricing based on an organization's ability to be resilient and stand back up after an attack. So let's talk a little bit about ransomware resilience and the ability to stand back up. Connor, you wanna add some comments here? Sure, so I think, you know, we wanna highlight that, you know, resilience is, is very important. We're not saying that protection and monitoring are not important anymore. They are required, they're necessary, but they're not enough because we really try to coach and, and recommend people assume they're gonna be breached because so many companies are. You can have all the network security, all the endpoint security, et cetera, all the monitoring, but you can be breached. And that typically is gonna happen now through some sort of social engineering and phishing where they're gonna get the credentials. So let's imagine you've got a great fortress, you've got everything set up in protection, but your IT admin gets socially engineered and his credentials are stolen. We've seen in situations where all of the protection was turned off and a second later, the ransomware deployed, everything's encrypted. So you bought all that stuff, but you still were able to have the credentials taken and control the systems, those turned off and then exploited. So it's, it's important to make sure these people are sophisticated. They're figuring out who they need to socially engineer. They're taking the time to look and figure out, you know, is it the CFO, is it the CEO, is it the owner, is it the IT admin, who has the credentials that we need? So that said, if they're able to, they also are getting the credentials to the backup software. You know, all the big name brands, if they have the credentials to the domain admin or the IT admin, they're able to get into the backup software either cripple it, destroy it, delete it, delete all the backup sets, encrypt the entire backup server. You can't restore backups if the backup server doesn't work. So they're really raising the level of sophistication um, and that destruction of recovery path is what really needs to be solved if there's gonna be resilience to ransomware. Um, and that really can be done in a number of ways, but really what you've gotta be focusing on is how do I get back up and running? If I'm assuming I'm going to be breached, how quickly can my organization stand back up so that we can generate revenue, so that we can not have expenses um, and we can recover our business? So ransomware is reality. Many organizations, even if they have the protection, will get ransomware. You need to really be focusing on um, a managed situation where someone's job or someone's required to make sure recovery paths are working um, so you don't have to pay the ransom. Um, I think, Pete, if you also switch to the next slide, if you have um, really what you want to focus on if you're building a resilient solution is that you have a secured, encrypted, and air-gapped backup, right? So we've heard about air-gapping. We've heard about the 3 two, one rule. You want to make sure something is off-site, but you can't just have that in some DR site or other building where there's a VPN open to traverse that path. You wanna make sure they can't get across that. You need to use something over HTTPS or TLS where you're actually air gapping storage so that they can access the data and that data is immutable to, by design in the data center. The second thing though, is we're talking about backups, you also wanna air gap the credentials. If the credentials to the backup software, even if the data is air gap is available, they can log in to that offsite location and delete the backup sets. You really want to make sure you're air gapping both credentials and storage, but at the same time, you need to dedicate resources to focus on this, to be alerted if there's a problem with the backup, to be alerted if there's tampering going on with the server that's running the backups. Unfortunately, 
when you want to be resilient, backups and recovery paths can't be an afterthought that you test when you get hacked. Um, otherwise, if you do not hide those recovery paths and, you know, and the credentials from the attackers, you're looking at a situation where the attacker has all the leverage. You want to have all the leverage. You want to go say, no thanks to a ransom payment. I've got my backups. I'm good to go. That's a great point. You've got to be able to stand back up um, on your own. Right? Assume that you're going to get breached and be in a position where you have a hidden set of backups so that you can recover. Yep. And as this this graphic illustrates, you know, your you know, social engineering and penetration, that's going to happen. They're going to try to delete the recovery paths. You need to make sure your recovery paths are not broadcast. The credentials are not easily accessible. The backup sets and software are protected with different credentials. And if possible, you're separating those credentials from within inside your environment. Otherwise, you're going to be you know, a crippled business paying a ransom payment, or you're using some tool. Yes, and I'm tuning my own horn. We have a solution called AirGap that really focuses on that. But you need an AirGap solution to be able to restore your business because otherwise you can't stand back up. Fantastic. Great comments, Connor. Um, as, as we walk through this in the last few minutes that we have, Connor, I want to talk about your business, right? Because we alluded at the beginning, we were going to talk about the, the evolution and anatomy of the growth of your business. Um, and based on what you've seen is you've migrated from being an MSP to an MSSP to, you know, recovery and, and, and rebuild. You know, how do you do this? And, and, and what, you know, what's the DNA of your organization that you were able to move like this? Um, I think the key for us was you need to want to continuously improve and you need to be able to evolve and be willing to be wanting to evolve quickly, because especially in the cyberspace, you know, the nature of an event, you know, is different this year than it was last year. It's different this month than it was last month. So uh, key to our organization is that sort of you know, personal resilience. How quickly can you change and adapt? It's been very key to success for us. Well, and I think one of the things that, that's very important to us here at the Carolina Cyber Center are these attributes of character, right? These six attributes of character that uh, are developing cybersecurity professionals of character, right? And, and what I've learned is that these six attributes that are so important to the Carolina Cyber Center are also a big piece of your business. So let's walk through each one of those if, if, if you can a little bit. Yeah, and I think these are core attributes that you want to see in any professional. But for us, there was a lot of alignment when we first started talking to Carolina Cyber Center about workforce development and needing staff to work on our help desk or to work in events. Um, and we really saw when, you know, when Adam was able to share these attributes with me, but well, this is kind of aligning with what we're doing and what we want to see in people. And I think if I can walk through it just from how we work, obviously, you know, this is a technical field. Right. So at a baseline, you have to have a technical skill. You have to have the certifications to know what you're doing. You have to have knowledge of the subject matter. But the key also thing is you got to have experience. And sometimes when you're in school, that's hard to get that real world experience. You know, you go away on, in summer for an internship. But these people need to have experiences. And that's where we really align is to start generating real world, you know, live hack experience for the students of the CCC. But if you have that technical skill, you still got to have the critical thinking to think best about how to execute that work, how to execute the skills and certifications that you've developed. But on top of that, you want to have someone who's got a deep level or a deep curiosity to understand how things work and to be asking why. Okay, yes, I'm thinking critically. Why is it that we're doing it this way? And, I, and also to have that curiosity to want to continue to learn to gain new experiences, to gain new certifications, because with an industry that's evolving as rapidly as cyber is, in six months, you could be way behind. And unless you have a sense of curiosity to want to learn new stuff, you're going to get left behind very quickly. Um, so those you know, first three are very important. But I think the next group, obviously, you know, discipline is important. You could have all the skills of critical thinking, but you've also got to be able to execute on that daily. You're taking those abilities and turning that into an achievement. You've got to show up day in, day out to be able to do that sort of stuff. And as we've seen where some of the students have been involved in real life um, hacks, you've got to have some grit. These are not pretty situations. People are under stress. Um, you've got to have some guts to go into 
potentially difficult and challenging technical situations, but they're also difficult and, tech, uh, and challenging socially. You're dealing with people who are not on their best behavior um, and are under a lot of stress. But I think the sixth item that you have here is probably my number one. You can have one through five, but if you are not a person that can collaborate, if you can't work with others, right, you can't work in a team, people can't trust you, um, it's very difficult to grow. So the first five are super important, but at the end of the day, most cyber centers, most SOCs, most, you know, IT teams, uh, recovery teams, you're working as a group. Um, and without that core attribute, that ability to collaborate and work well with others, um, I think careers would get stifled, you know, or, 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 or wouldn't be as successful. Um, and I think, you know, we've had some individuals that from the CCC, as I mentioned, that have been involved in hacks, especially within the last 60 days and have moved on from one to the next because they've got these skills. And we're really excited about a continued relationship with the CCC to provide those real world experiences. And I think, okay, yeah, there it is. Um, you know, obviously, you know, we have uh, an alignment with the CCC because we need staff. You know, I, I'm being selfish here. We need teams. Sometimes I'll get a call and says, hey, we need 15 people tomorrow. I might not have those 15 people because we're involved in another engagement. And so we've got here Braden Horton and Uriel Rosario who got involved in a very large Fortune 750 type company, 19,000 users, 700 locations. And these two guys stepped in. I think they were given 24 hour notice um, that we needed them jumped into the fire, so to speak, um, took on the needs, trained up, and were serving users the next day. They both graduated on, have been involved in different hacks. So this is sort of a real or, or market validation, Pete, that this situation, these skills and being willing to adapt quickly and provide great technical skill, um, it's, it's been a really good symbiotic relationship so far. Yeah, and, and I think what's, you know, everybody who goes to this program, they want to have the real life experience, right? But being part of the team and being part of the experience is one thing. They actually had real life contribution, right? They were not just along for the ride. They were significant players in helping this organization stand back up. Um, and, and these type of attacks, you can't plan for them. You don't know when they're going to happen, right? This is you know, this is the ability to be on call, to be flexible, to understand that whatever your role was in the last recovery, it might be different in the next one, right? And, and maybe, Connor, that gets to your point about value number six is the ability to collaborate, right? The ability yeah. to respect the other voices at the table, understand people's perspectives, but everybody's moving forward in a non-linear way, we talked about that as well, right? It's gonna have its cycles. Generally things are moving up and to, you know, up and to the, to the right, but they're gonna cycle through some of those changes. Collaboration is what brings that all together. Yeah, I mean, for us, we hope that every member of the CCC, every student is getting involved. We, and before I got on to, uh, you know, to, for this uh, talk, I mean, I had a message that there's two live engagements that we need to look at, one of which needs a help desk so uh, probably when I get off of this, I'm going to have to figure out, you know, what other members we're going to need. Um, and so that's been great where I know I can quickly make a call, see who's available and get people into action without going through a bunch of uh, red tape and complexity because the CCC has really helped give us that agility we need. I love it. Thank you for the comments. You know, the, we, the, the alignment, it's comforting to know that the values, the six attributes that we talked about at the Carolina Cyber Center are very similar to what you have in your organization. And your organization has clearly grown and gotten into some cutting edge space um, after what was for 10 plus years, kind of a traditional managed service provider. Um, and then the other validation is that not only do the values work, the individuals who go through the program, that works, right? These are individuals who you picked up plugged in, had immediate impact in a firefight situation, and you're going back to the well in two more things that you just got called on earlier today. That's fantastic. So Absolutely. for anybody else out there in the marketplace, um, this model works, plain and simple. Um, and, and so if you're looking for individuals um, to provide value to your business, maybe to your clients uh, as part of an internship or some sort of a flexible program, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, 
it's absolutely adding value out there. These are great individuals, a great program, and they have IT peripheral vision as well as cyber experience and knowledge. So again, Connor, thank you um, for your contribution today, for your partnership with the Carolina Cyber Center. Uh, and to the audience, thank you for listening. We hope you got something out of the presentation and enjoy the rest of the conference. All right. Well, thank you so much, Pete and Connor. Uh, Connor did have to run. Pete, I see you out there. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks again. Um, questions from the, the audience. We have one here for you, Pete. How do you approach communicating ransomware incidents where the attack's root cause was neglected by internal IT? Hey, Connor. Hey, we both made it. Thanks for having us. Can you repeat that question? I would, we, it, it faded out a bit. Yeah. So it's how do you approach communicating ransomware incidents where the attack's root cause was the neglect of internal IT? <laughs> uh, Pete, maybe I'll take that one. Um, I, I think with grace um, and in a lot of these recovery events, there is a lot of finger pointing going on or sure people protecting their jobs and being concerned. Um, I think it's also assumed a lot of times this, these sort of things happen because of internal IT. And it's not really internal IT's fault. There could be business decisions that didn't allow internal IT to make budgetary you know, decisions to, to get things to protect them. And you see sometimes infighting. Um, but as I mentioned, internal IT is the target. They're the ones trying to be socially engineered and organizations need to be a little bit more secure and protecting, you know, and making their internal staff less visible to attackers. Um, you know, one thing we talk about a lot is just making them less visible, even on LinkedIn, which seems counterintuitive, but that is a big signal to, you know, hey, I'm the guy with all the credentials that you should probably try to engineer. Yeah, and, and Adam, I'll add to that. One of the oh, go ahead, Pete. core tenants that I believe in is to, you know, especially when everybody needs to come together as a team to resolve something, the important thing is to fix the problem, not fix the blame, right? So, you know, assess what happened and carve a path forward. There'll be plenty of time later to interpret why it happened, who may be at fault, what situation led up to it, and just kind of move forward from there. Yeah, to people, process, and technology. I, I uh, talk to our students a lot about the value of communication and collaboration. One of them is to be able to take and distill what is a complex subject down into something that present, presents itself to executives so that they can make informed decisions. And I've seen IT departments, woe is me, they, they don't have the support, they don't have the resources and the tools and staff they need, but they lack the skill to be able to communicate that to the executives in a way that built relationships, build people up, don't just try and educate them. People, you know, if education and access to information was the answer, we'd all look like Brad Pitt and have six pack abs. It's not. It takes a collaborative approach that is that is not trivial and it's often not taught in school. How do you distill this complex stuff down into something that helps somebody make a decision? Spending as much time proving yourself right as proving yourself wrong. So it's that collaboration. I agree completely. But Andrew, thanks for the good question. If you've uh, got another out there, we've got another question. What are the major considerations to keep on the radar when shopping for cybersecurity insurance now that things are changing with ransomware attacks? Well, I think one thing to keep in mind um, would be to really get a good idea of how much coverage you actually have, right? A lot of people are underinsured considering ransoms are going up. So I would encourage everyone to, to go out and reevaluate their plan because if ransom payments and the costs are doubling, you may have a policy that doesn't really follow suit. Um, another key thing would be to just make sure they're really evaluating what clauses might be in there because as Pete's highlighted, carriers are gonna to start to be a little bit more particular and most likely more of the onus will be on the insured to make sure they've met certain qualifications. So, I mean, that would be my take. Yeah, and, and I would say, you know, know your limits and, and know your sublimits, right? Once you assess what your risk is and you're able to quantify that risk, um, you, you, you want to be able to ensure yourself to mitigate that cost, right? And transfer that to someone else. So you have to pay attention to the fine details of the limits. Um, one other thing, and maybe I'm, I'm tooting my own horn, obviously, you know, we run a, 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 a group that does ransomware resilience, right? And we have protection tools around that. A lot of people are not really thinking about enough. Yes, I need protection tools, but can I actually stand back up from 
a ransom event or ransomware um, and be able to operate so I'm not tapping into that assurance or I'm able to get more things back so the ransom's not as high, right, et cetera, or the cost to recover are not causing me to be self-insured where the insurance plan has now maxed out. Cool. Well, I know we're at the top of the hour. I want to respect your time. Great education, great presentation. Thank you so much for your collaboration and your counsel. Um, there was a little bit of a vote going on behind the scenes of who had the better beard. So I won't uh, tell you who the he, winner he is. He does. I'm just trying to emulate <laughs> Pete. He's, he's like my big brother. So I'm just trying to be as good as Pete is. All so right. I think he should win. It's yeah, coming off I didn't get a single <laughs> vote, by the way. But anyway. Yeah. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time today uh, and for the audience. Tomorrow at 1130, we have a great presentation. It's going to be facilitated by Ed Scotus from Counterhack and the Sands Institute. He's going to talk to Tom McGrath from the Department of Public Safety here in North Carolina, Jessica Nye from the FBI, and our state's chief risk officer, um, Maria Thompson. They're going to talk about the whole estate approach. When you talk to one organization versus another, what's the state of the union in cybersecurity? Just how bad is it? And what is the state of North Carolina doing about it to help protect you? And, and what can you do to protect yourself? So we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Uh, thank you so much for, for a great day and your great questions. We look forward to seeing you then. Cheers. Bye-bye.